Um, that, that was consumer behavior. Just an example here of um, provider behavior that can be studied. Uh, now, this is a topic that's really attracted health economists, something called supplier-induced demand. Let me say a bit about this. In economics, we're very used to thinking of demand as being based on an individual's preferences, what they va the different value they put on different outcomes, their income, um, the relative prices of different goods, and these sorts of factors. And so we very much think of the individual as the demander. But in areas such as healthcare, while the individual does demand health care, that demand is frequently um, at least mediated through the doctor. And this is because of a, what we call the jargon, an asymmetry of information. Doctors have a lot of knowledge about how the body works, how it will respond to different treatments, uh, what symptoms might be suggestive of what conditions. Patients have some knowledge, but much less knowledge about how their body works, about what opportunities there are for different treatments, what the prospects are of responding to different treatments. And so consequently, in the healthcare sector, we frequently, as patients, essentially give the decision making over to the doctor. Uh, there'll still be dialogue usually, one hopes, and discussion, but we're, we, we stop being the demander and uh, at the very least it's a joint decision, shall we say, at the very least. And this has given rise to the possibility of supplier-induced demand, the doctor being the supplier. And so it might be that sometimes uh, the demand for health care is not coming essentially from the, the, the patient, but is coming from the doctor. And so for a formal definition uh, of supplier-induced demand, it's demand in excess of what would be chosen if the patient had the same information available as the doctor, but the patient still has their own preferences. So if the patient has the information, all that technical information and experience, it's not just information, if the patient has that knowledge that the doctor has, what would they demand? And if the demand is greater than that, if what the doctor's choosing for the patient is greater than that, that would be described as supplier-induced demand. And so this um, is possibly arising because in healthcare we have this asymmetry information. Doctors are more knowledgeable than the patients. And to help us with our decisions, we go to the doctor, he or she then helps us. But one consequence might be that some of the decisions the doctor makes are influenced not, or they aren't the decisions we would have made, they're decisions they are making. Now, this isn't restricted to healthcare. There's many situations of potential information asymmetry. Um, think of, have we anybody who has a motor vehicle? Probably the wrong age segment of the population to have motor vehicles. But um, if you have a car or a motorbike, how knowledgeable are, are you about how that engine works? And if it makes a funny noise, how, do you know what's wrong with it? Um, do you know when it's making a funny noise, even? Or what about house building? You've got a hole in your roof, maybe. It's leaking. So you can have a, get up on the ladder, have a good look, diagnose the problem, decide what needs to be done. No, you typically put yourself in the hands of the, the builder. You put yourself in the hands of the car mechanic. Or a more exotic example, wine waiters. Have we any real sake experts here? I'm sure one or two, but um, 
you go to a restaurant and you might sometimes think, oh, it's a special, I really like a, something special today. I'll ask the wine waiter or whatever for advice. Or if you like module organizers, I like this one. Some courses are optional and you could go to the person who runs the course and say, do you think this course would be, I should attend this course? Yes or no? Now, all of these situations have the same characteristic. The doctor, patient, car mechanic, motorist, um, house builder, resident, wine waiter, customer, module organizer, student. They're all characterized by this asymmetry of information. And so they all have a potential for supplier inducement, for a decision being made that's different from the one that, well, what we call the, I don't want too much jargon, the principal would have chosen if they had the same information. Um, there's a couple of old examples here, but I, I, I like them. This was a study done a long time ago now, 20 years, goodness. Quite worrying how time passes. Caesarean sections. Now, you may or may not be aware that around the world, uh, most countries, the rate of caesarean section um, is really quite high and much higher than, for example, WHO would argue is necessary on medical grounds. Now, this, um, this was a study done, so it's historical, um, but it, was, it, it looked at the um, United States and between 1970 and 1982, there was quite a, a fall in US fertility. Probably not just in the US, but a 13.5% fall in fertility. And so what these uh, authors uh, tried to f discover was whether or not this um, fall in fertility and therefore consequent lo potential loss of income to obstetricians and gynaecologists, whether this had any effect on their behavior. And so, in particular, they were hypothesizing that because of the fall of fertility, the, uh, these medical professionals might induce demand for caesarean sections because caesarean sections, I guess in all countries, but certainly in the US, pay better than vaginal deliveries. Now, they were able to examine this because the timing and the extent of the fall in fertility in the United States varied across states. So some states, fertility started falling earlier than other states. Um, some states it fell a long way. Some states it fell less far, the fertility. And so given this variability across 50 states over time in the decline in fertility, they could then try and associate that with what was happening to C-sections as a proportion of deliveries. And they found um, a strong correlation between the decline in fertility and the increase in cesarean section rates. Now, of course, this could be coincidental. But because fertility was dropping at different times, at different rates in different states, if there's another explanation, this was also having a differential effect starting at different times, going at different states, um, speeds in different states. So there's a suspicion that it's not just uh, chance. And the quantitative relationship is not vast, but a 10% drop in fertility was associated with a 0.6% increase in cesarean sections. Another example, this is again in the US, thoracic surgery. Now, um, there's a big federal healthcare program, Medicare, which is for the elderly. Um, I think currently still defined as over 65s. Although whether that's due for a reconsideration, I don't know. But uh, Medicare uh, is a federal 
essentially insurance programme to cover the costs of a lot of the care of the elderly. And from time to time, they change the fees that they're willing to pay. And at one point, there was a reform of Medicare fees, which would have led to a 26% drop in the income of thoracic surgeons if they'd continued doing the same volume of activity. So there was the existing fee structure. It was changed. If these uh, surgeons continued to behave in exactly the same way, their income would have dropped 26%. And what they observed uh, was an increase in activity by thoracic surgeons, which allowed them to recoup or get back 70% of the lost income. Now again, it may just be coincidence, but that's, that's what they found. Now, yeah. Thoracic surgery specifically, um, where's the thought of that in here somewhere, isn't it? Um, do more surgery, I guess, or request them to come back more often. I don't know. Um, any thoracic surgeons in the room? <laughs> yes. Well, that's the implication. The implication is that prior to the change in fees, they were doing particular procedures at a particular rate. After the change in fees, they were doing more procedures. Now, there may be other explanations. I, that's a good question. I, I don't really know what thoracic surgeons do. I mean, are there lots of things that are quite sort of optional? You know, you could do them or not do them. I, I don't know. But that's the implication, and that the patients go along with this because the asymmetry of information, they, they, they trust the surgeon to, to make the right decision in their interests.